I wanted to, to, to preach tonight a little message for you here because it's been a little while. We've had a lot of special things on Sunday night, and then we'll have a, some more prayer and at the end, some worship, and then you'll, you can d- be dismissed as you go. But I want to try to respect the time and get started here. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 50. Our key verse is going to be verse 21. I want you to read it to get a context because the idea here is that we in America have made God something he is not. We need to know the real God. Uh, The real God uh, is way different than most churches portray God. He's different than what most churches say who God is. Here it is, the mighty one. uh, I'm in the NIV, uh, chapter 50, verse 1. And this will not be on your screen. So if you have your Bible, open it up or open it on your electronic device. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal in the forest is mine, and the cattle of a, on a thousand hills, I, all, they're all mine. I know every bird in the mountains. And the creatures of the field, they're mine. I, if, I, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, all that is, is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him. You throw in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You speak continually against your brother and slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and and I kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you. I want you to look at that verse, verse 21. We have that verse up there, Psalm 50, 21. These things you have done and I kept silent. And I read those so that you could get this verse. You've done all this. I kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you. That's the way the heathen think. And many people in the church that don't truly know God and only know uh, know what they want to know and what they make up about God, they're wrong. You thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and accuse you to your face. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue. He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way. Now listen, so that I may show him the salvation of God. So he's pointing to the sacrifices of the Old Testament covenant as being a picture of the salvation God, of the one to come as a sacrifice who is Jesus Christ. But he's talking about people that are trying to declare something God is that he is not. We want to make God, just like the Israelites did, made the golden calf. We want to make God... Uh, what we think God ought to be. Well, that's not the kind of God I serve. How many of you ever heard that phrase? That's not the kind of God I serve. Well, let me tell you something. The kind of God that I serve is right here. Right here in this book. And the greatest thing to know the real God is to understand that he reveals himself through his attributes. A little boy was drawing a picture on a piece of paper, and his mother came up to him and said, ask him, "What, what are you drawing? The little boy said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. The mother informed him, well, no one knows what God looks like. The little boy said, well, when I get through drawing this picture, they will. (laughs) What kind of mental picture do we have of God? The danger we all face in our thoughts about God is that we tend to recreate God in our own image rather than seeing God as he is revealed in Scripture, as I've mentioned. Too often our thoughts about God are adjusted to our own desires. You hear that? We adjust who we think God is. We adjust it to our own desires rather than adjusting our thinking to God 
as he is and revealed to us through his holy word. The God of the Bible is not the product of human imagination and his nature is not changed by our opinion of him. So it really doesn't matter very much what kind of God we'd like to believe in, yet people keep talking what I, just like I said, the kind of God I believe in, uh, that's not the type of God I, I believe in when and they'll say that. It's all because a part of our culture search for, listen, a permissive God. That's why. People are looking for a permissive God, a, a God that's only love, a God that's only a God that gives gifts, and they don't want a God that is a holy God. Now I understand that God is holy and gracious and merciful and even his acts of judgment is to bring us to his love to show us his mercy. That's true. When Jesus called his disciples, he didn't ask them what kind of God they believed in. He didn't say, what kind of God do you believe in? Or if, or if they love God, Jesus just simply said, follow me. You see, if we'll sincerely desire to follow Jesus, and open our hearts, he'll reveal himself to us in a real way. And we need to see God as he really is. That's the greatest need of each Christian today. Realigning our thoughts about God with the divine characteristics revealed in the Holy Word. Uh, and, and that's the greatest challenge for our culture today. It's for people to believe what this says about God instead of what we want to believe about God and super impose our thoughts about who God is and override who God says he is. In Numbers, and you can take little notes and look into the Old Testament book Numbers, verse, chapter 23, verse 19, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? In other words, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. God cannot lie. He will not lie. Uh, he, he cannot sin. He does not sin. God, uh, when he promises, he acts. He, he, he is a true God, a faithful God. And uh, I, I will guarantee you when you put your hope and trust in him, you got a God that will act. Listen, the biggest problem in our churches today, we see God is small and our problems is big. Pastor Hawkins touched on this. God is big. In comparison to God and his power, our troubles are small. God is eternal, and yet we try to make God temporary and measure him by our temporary lives. When the children of Israel made a, a calf uh, out of gold in the wilderness, it wasn't that they were completely rejecting God. That wasn't what was going on but they wanted to recreate him in their own image. They wanted to recreate God in, 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 their, in human image. Notice what Moses writes in Exodus, if you got your Bibles, chapter 32, Exodus 32, the first six verses. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together around Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that shall go before us for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. In other words, bring me some gold. Bring your earrings. So all the people broke off golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten, molten calf. He, 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 he took and, and shaped a calf there. And then they said, look at this. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now the Israelites knew that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob brought them out of the land of Israel. They weren't totally rejecting God. They just had the wrong God. And this is the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Now Aaron is building a place to make sacrifices, a place to worship before this golden calf. And he made a proclamation. He said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Not, he didn't say to the golden calf. He said to the Lord. And then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. Here they're bringing worship. And the people sat down to eat 
and drink and rose up to play. It sounds a little bit like Christian church on Sunday morning in America. What's, pro what's the problem? The people had made God in their own image. They had made God what they wanted him to be. And they came and did their practice of worship and went on and ate and played and had the rest of the day. But they weren't worshiping the true God because they had got confused somewhere along the way. The man of God wasn't there to say, this is who God is. They allowed themselves to be deceived. And when, when, you know, when they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt, it, it wasn't, like I said, a complete rejection. They just recreated God in their own image, in their own image of him. And if we spend our lives trying to fit God into the pattern that we think God is, that we ought to follow, then we've done the same thing the Israelites did in the wilderness when they shaped their God into a calf, a golden calf. We want to make God that's not the God that I serve. My God's not like that. And we want to take and say things about God. Well, I don't care what it says. That's not who God is because that's what America's doing. And that's why there is no respect and awe for our God. Isaiah 40, 18 to 22. Listen to these, these, these words. Isaiah chapter 40, 18, 22. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol... A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashioned silver, silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood which, uh, that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understand? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and he spreads them out like a tent to live in. What is it saying there? It's creative imagery to say that God is so big, so powerful. He absolutely flung the stars into space and hung, put the sun and the moon and galaxies beyond our imagination. And he made, he made man and said, like Pastor Jeff said this morning, and he said, it's very good. And God loves you and God wants to bless you. There's so many positive things, but the problem is until we can get to the grace and the love and the forgiveness and the goodness of God, we have to acknowledge God is the real God, who he really is. Over 40 years ago, A.W. Tozier wrote concerning the desperate need for the church to revise the concept of God in their brain. That concept of God had been distorted. And so Tozer, A.W. Tozer wrote this, and I quote, it is my opinion that the Christian conception of God, current in the middle years of the 20th century, is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God and actually to constitute for professed believers something amounting to moral calamity. Tozer goes on and says, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate the church's concept of God. Who is God to you? Remember Isaiah? When the Lord showed up and his train, his glory filled the temple, he cried, woe is me, I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. He fell down on his face before God because, and the angels, the seraphim, they cried, holy, holy, holy. You see, in the, in, in the sight of God, we see ourselves of great need. And that's why when you have the wrong concept of who God is and, and what God stands for and what his demands are and, 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 and what he teaches, if we, if we just dismiss them, then we've dismissed our need for God and we then remove the ability for God's grace to come into our hearts. Because until we see ourselves in the light of who God is 
and how powerful and large and mighty and everlasting and wonderful God is, how holy he is, how righteous he is, that he's the judge of all the earth, the Bible says, and will he not do right, then we're going to come up with wrong conclusions on one side or the other. To stay with me because you probably are hearing me say something that I'm not going to end up saying in the end. You're going to be surprised in a moment. But we really must know the true God. See, in Eden, we begin to understand that the knowledge of God is the key of life. The theme runs throughout Scripture. God told the Israelites in Hosea 6, 6, that his desire was that we would have the knowledge of him, now the knowledge of God, more than he desires that we would have make burnt offerings to him. In uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 4, the, this is what the Lord says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. See, that's, that's what we need. We need to understand and know that I am the Lord. And, and so, that he, let, let him that boasts, boast about this, and I don't think the rest of the verse is up there, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. This is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. You see, to know God, to know the God, to know Jesus Christ, the real God, is life eternal. We must come to know God, and to know God, when we know him, we realize who we are, and we realize what great gift that God has given. We realize what great sin that God has given Jesus Christ to forgive us when we see the great God is who he is when you really know him. A.W. Pink wrote, and it's a little bit deep, but just start, see if you can use your intellect here. He's a, he's a great uh, a person, theologian, that wrote in commentary, that wrote a, a lot about God. He said, the God of this century no more resembles the sovereign of holy writ than does the dim flickering of a candle the glory of the midday sun. The God who's talked about in the average pulpit or spoken of in, a, in the ordinary Sunday school or mentioned much uh, in the religious literature of the day and preached in most of the so-called Bible conferences is a figment of human imagination, an invention of modeling uh, uh, sentimentality. The heathen outside the pale of Christendom form gods of wood and stone, while millions of heathen inside Christendom manufacture of God out of their own carnal minds. We shape a God out of our own selfish desires that God would be this way. A God that doesn't mind us living for our own pleasure. Someone asked me, what do you see as the biggest problem in our culture? This is one of our church members, Saturday. What's the biggest problem in the church? And immediately I knew. And it encompasses many things. It's just what it says, Paul said to Timothy, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, proud, blasphemers, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Is it just outside the church? What is it that makes a person want to just know God a little bit and make heaven, but get all they can get in this life? It's the fact that they don't see God for who he really is. Because when you get a glimpse, then you wouldn't ever let an opportunity to give away a week at a resort and four days, four day tickets, four four day tickets to Disney World go by to invite someone. And yet I wonder, how many people didn't even think to invite someone who might need to be given Jesus? Didn't even bother. But when you see God for who he is, you're motivated. A God that says, I'm gonna come again. A God says, there'll be no more time. A God that says, work while it is day, for the night comes when no one can work. A God that says, today is the day of salvation. A God that says, don't fear man what he can do for, to you, but fear God who can cast your soul into eternal damnation. You see, do we believe that God, this is a modern, modern, modern God thing is this, as God doesn't really care what you do, he just loves you anyway and loves everybody. Well, he loves everyone, but he does care what you do because he gave Jesus his son who died and suffered for you. Oh yes, he loves you. He loves you enough to take away the curse of sin and death and eternal torment. 
That's what he loves you. He loves you by giving his son. It's not just a fairy tale, it's the real deal. If you don't believe it, go to Israel with me and all of a sudden, faith will become sight. When you go and see, you'll be convinced. Philippians 3, see, the, let me say this first. The truly knowing God is life's greatest ambition and only the only hope of transforming our lives and our world is through coming to know God as he's revealed in Scripture. The great men and women throughout history are those that devoted themselves to the study of God's character. Philippians 3, 8 to 11 says this. Philippians 3, verse 8 to 11. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. What is more, Paul said, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I wanna know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his, in his death. In other words, laying down my life and saying, not my will, but your will be done becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, to know, I'm gonna skip over a little bit of this, but to know God is, is, is the essence, is what the Bible says. Oh, that I might know him, the prophet said. Seeing God as he is has to do with knowing God's ways and his character. How else can you know a person? Knowing a person beyond knowing what they look like, that's what we need, the character, the ways of God. So when you look at the attributes of God, they're revealed in God's, it reveals God's glory. When you see the character of God, the attributes of God, his glory is revealed. And unless we know them, we won't know them, we won't worship him. It's little wonder that Moses bowed to the ground when, he, when God revealed his character traits. It is God's attributes that demand our attention. Throughout the Bible, when God is worshiped, he's worshiped in response to his attributes. And it's only when we come to know God's attributes that we bow in humble adoration. Psalm 717 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Psalm 107, 1 and 2 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed, those that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus, to redeem something is to buy something back. Jesus said, the Bible says of, of us that we were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus, not gold and silver. We were bought with a price, the blood of Christ on that cross. Let the redeemed, those that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus, of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. You see, seeing God as he is is so important. Knowing God's character is the very basis for our faith and trust in God. You see that knowing that God's grace is wholeheartedly governed by his commitment in compassion, in love, in holiness, in justice, in every circumstance is the very basis of our relationship with him. Now listen, it's especially important when we don't understand the why behind what's happening. In those times, our faith in the character of God enables us to trust that he's doing what is best in every circumstance. Did you hear that? Our faith in the character of God and belief and knowing God and his character helps us when we don't understand why. Like the old song that Erica used to sing, when you can't trace his hand, uh, uh, when you don't know his plan, trust his heart. You know God. And that's why it's so important for us to see God as he is. In those times, our faith in the character of God enables us to trust him that he's doing what is the best in every circumstance. Knowing God's character, that's what made Job of old be able to say, well, I don't know what's going on, but I know that someday I'm gonna rise again, I'm gonna stand upon the earth. The worms may get my body in the meantime, but I know that God's gonna raise me up and I'm gonna be all right. You see, that's knowing the character of God. Knowing God's character gives us a new perspective on life. When we begin to view life from God's perspective, nothing will more radically change the way we look at life and circumstances than seeing God just as he is. God's character reveals to us the basis of his grace. Listen, you hear that? God's character reveals 
the basis of his grace. There's no way we can fully understand God's grace without understanding God's character. Moses wrote, you have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. God has revealed himself to us because he's pleased with us. See, it's, it's, it's not... It, 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 there's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. We, he comes to us and he calls to us and when we respond, he reveals more of himself. It's light upon light. If we come to know him, then and, on, and only then when we really know him, then God's gonna reveal more light and more kindness when we respond. It's like in any human relationship. When God revealed himself to Moses, he said, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And yet there are many verses that talk about his judgment against those things. But look, he's talking to people that respond Asking God to forgive, respond in repentance, respond in, in, in seeing and understanding God's word. You see, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. The Bible says clearly in that verse to Moses. So understanding God's character is the basis of understanding the Bible. You see, as we view God's loving, forgiving kindness, we realize that his love demands that sin be punished. It's the very basis of God's grace. There's no way God can love what is good without hating what is evil. The very nature of God's grace forbids us to do what is wrong. It doesn't have anything to do with rules or regulations or legalism. It has everything to do with the character of God, of Almighty God, and His character is the basis of life. The question is not if God is an all good God. Absolutely, He is a good God. It's if God. The question is not if God is an all good God, how can he send someone to hell? It is, good, it is his good character that demands that evil destructive forces of sin be destroyed once and for all. Listen, because his love forbids that suffering sin, all that suffering sin brings. You see, God hates sin, why? Sin's missing the mark. Why? Because it always hurts people. Lying hurts someone, cheating hurts someone, stealing hurts somebody, adultery hurts somebody. People are hurt by sin. God loves people and he hates sin. He has love and mercy and grace, but he has justice and judgment. Both love and justice temper his favor toward us. God's grace demands justice, but true justice also demands grace. How would you like to live in a culture where no one ever was punished for their crimes, for their evil done against humanity? It doesn't work. And nobody is more loving and forgiving and kind and gracious and merciful than God. But he wants things to change and to turn. And so sometimes there are things that God does that we can't question. We can't say, well, God can't be like that. God, my God's not some big mean God that does something bad to somebody. The Bible, the Bible actually clearly teaches, shockingly so, that God will allow bad things to come your way to wake you up so you'll turn to God. When you hit the bottom, some people, they won't turn to God by his kindness. That's his number one method, thy loving kindness. He's shown God by his goodness, his mercy, his kindness. But when they don't, he'll let you hit the bottom. So you go, help me, God, and you reach up to the top. So we have both. Here's the thing. You're never going to understand God, because, and neither am I, because we are merely mortals. But if you know God's character, you can trust him in his dealings with man when you don't understand. And sometimes it's judgment. And sometimes it's mercy. But I'm gonna tell you what, if there's judgment, he's always doing it to bring us to his mercy. Never does he extend his judgment without wanting to bring us to his mercy. Otherwise, what would he be doing giving his own son to die on a cruel death on a cross? You know, you, it seems cruel to you, you gotta remember, God himself, it was God himself that died on the cross to meet the demands of his own character that demanded grace and justice. He's not demanding any more of us than he demanded of himself. It's all the more reason to trust God's character and count on his grace. So I close with this. So many people today don't want 
to be bothered with their morality or their choices. People today want to make up their own God. People today do not want a God who makes demands and interferes with our personal business, especially in the areas of sex and money. Every time we begin to lose sight of God, we begin to do what we believe to be right in our own eyes, and our culture rejects the idea of moral absolutes because we've lost sight of the God of Scripture. There are moral absolutes. Many say they believe in a God of love, not a God of law. We've ceased to ponder the moral perfection of God. When the laws of Mount Sinai were given, there were laws that were emanated from the very character of God who gave them. The God that said to his people, both in Leviticus and in Peter, be holy for I am holy. Peter said, therefore prepare your minds, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. What is it to be holy? When you see God, you fall on your knees and you cry out that he is holy and you ask him to come and place a a fire like Isaiah did on your tongue and to say, woe is me, you cry out. And to be holy is to be separated unto God, to desire God more than self, God's way more than your way is to be God. See, the question is not if God is an all good God, how can he send someone to hell? Don't ever forget that. Do you know that God... I don't believe God's ever going to send anybody, quote, unquote, to hell. People choose to go there and not heaven. God's wanting to send you to heaven. That's why he gave his son. He gave the gift. It's not his will that any perish. Let me say it again. The Bible clearly says it's not his will that any perish, but have all have everlasting life. That's why he gave his own son. So it's a pretty unfair, heartless thing to say, well, God sends somebody to hell. God's not his will. He doesn't delight in that. It's his will that you have life The enemy comes to destroy. He's a deceiver. He's the one full of darkness. He's the one that says, get all the life you can while you have it here. But every man knows there comes a day when their life on earth ends. Every man knows that they're not gonna breathe forever. They're gonna lay someday, somewhere, when their body ends, if the Lord tarries, they're gonna die. And then the Bible says the judgment. And if you choose not to believe in God, it's a pretty good, like Russian roulette. Pretty good little game to play, like... Bible roulette, you know, like shoot the bullet and hope it doesn't come out. Shoot the I don't believe in you, God, bullet. I personally have zero doubt, not only from my personal experience, but also from study. Once I began to study ancient literature, no longer did I even need the Bible to believe Jesus because it's written everywhere in ancient literature. It's been so preserved everywhere. Going to Israel is taking your faith and making it sight. There's no way that Jesus Christ is not the true God, the risen Lord, and he loves you. And I just beg of us as a church not to make up a God that doesn't exist here. If it says it here, that's who God is, okay? He's loving and forgiving, but he's also holy, right? So let's not forget it. Here's the worst thing you can do is go out there and go, I'm gonna do this. You know, you can't do this. The best thing you can do is see God, seek him to know him, and when you see him as you, as he really is, you fall like Isaiah and say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. You cry out for mercy. And then through that, God begins to come to you and reveal to you. It's just like he sent uh, the coals of fire up on Isaiah's lips. He will come, and that we need to do is experience the real God to know the real God. I want to know him. I want to see him. I want to be with him. There's a verse where Moses says, I won't go if you don't, you don't go. He said, we're not going anywhere if you're not going with me. God said, I will go with you. Let me tell you something. God will go with you. Remember, he doesn't change and he doesn't lie, and he will go with you if you just ask him. Will you bow your head with me? Father, in Jesus' name, let your Holy Spirit be strong with us today. I pray, God, we, we, we need you everywhere we go, the real God, the God of all creation, the almighty God, the one that's a merciful Savior, the one that's judge of all the earth, the one that's King of kings and Lord of lords. 
and the one that's to the suffering servant. Father God, we need you. It's very difficult for us as human beings to understand you fully as you are, but we want to know you. So according to Jesus' own words in the Sermon on the Mount, to seek first the kingdom of God, the God, your kingdom will come in our lives. Your will be done. The kingdom of God in your righteousness, God, to, to live through you in righteousness and to live right before man and God. We need you. We can't do it. We need your power, your grace. So reveal yourself, we pray, God, that we would see the real God and we'd be willing to take this book, the Holy Word, and begin to read it and study it and hunger for it, to know about your attributes, to understand who you are, that you would reveal your glory and your power to us, that we would bow before you and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.